We know from all the gospel writers that several women were present at the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. And that some of these women were also at the burial and the empty tomb. Who are these women who stood near the cross? And what can we learn from their example of discipleship? Matthew and Mark note that there were many women watching in the crowd that day. Matthew names Mary Magdalena, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Mark also names Mary Magdalena and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and then adds Salome. Luke identifies Mary Magdalena, Joanna, Mary, and the mother of James. And John even expands it to include the mother of Jesus, his mother's sister, and Mary of Clopas, in addition to Mary Magdalena. These were women who followed Jesus from Galilee. We first read about them in Luke chapter 8, where two distinct groups of followers are mentioned, the twelve and certain women. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalena, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chesa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were having to support them out of their own means. You know, it becomes obvious when we read the Gospels that these verses are not referring to a one-time event. It describes what happened throughout Jesus' ministry. You see, from this point on, Jesus is preaching and teaching with a wider group than just the twelve, a group that included many women. When the twelve are called, we read that they left everything and followed Jesus. This concept of following is often used to describe discipleship in the Gospels. And we also find it here with the references to the women. Just like the men, the women stood near the cross, were with Jesus. They had given up everything to follow, including the safety and security of their homes, relationships and reputations. The women were also providing for the ministry financially. You can imagine that when the disciples headed to Jerusalem that faithful week, their expectations were quite different from what they experienced when they got there. Regardless of gender, things escalate quickly once Jesus is arrested. And we see the disciples respond in three ways. Some of them run, including Peter. Some watch from a distance. And some stand near the cross. While the male disciples are noticeably absent from this point on the sto in the story, Matthew and Mark tell us that many of the women are still present. And John places four of them near the cross along with the disciples Jesus loved. The small group is close enough to have a private conversation with Jesus, which reveals that their nearness is not only positional, but also relational. My name is Salome. I grew up in Nazareth with Mary. We were inseparable until the angel came. Not that I knew that at the time, that the angel had come. One day, we were young women facing the future together. The next, Mary just stopped talking to me. Then the gossip started. She was pregnant, and it wasn't Joseph's. No one knew why Joseph stood by her. She brought shame right into his house, but still he protected her. He made no sense, it made no sense to anyone, 
They were the talk of the village. They went away for the census, and I didn't hear for years from her. Then one day, years later, she and Joseph returned with their little boy Jesus. They'd been in Egypt, apparently. Years went by, the gossip subsided, and we became close again. I remember so clearly when Jesus started to travel and teach. Mary was mortified. After being in the spotlight all those years, she had imagined a quiet old age, her family around her. It took her a while, but eventually she understood, and she'd reminisce about the strange events that happened at his birth. She'd always known, she said, that he wouldn't be just anybody. She just hadn't wanted to accept it. At first, I kept up with what he was doing for Mary's sake, but before long, I followed him for my sake. His teaching made sense of this world. It made sense of me. So I was there on that awful day. We were there. People often forget it, but we were there. Later, they said, all his followers had run away. But he had been left alone, quite alone, that everyone had left him. Everyone? I would ask. Yes, we all left him, Peter would say. We all, we're all as bad as each other. We all left him. We all fled. All of us? Yes, all of us. Every last. Ugh. Oh. It often took him a while, but most of the time he would get there in the end. At least until he forgot again. Not everyone. Exactly, I would say, not everyone. You see, we were there, Mary Magdalene and me. Obviously, not in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had gone ahead with the job by himself leaving us bemused and grieving on the roof. But the moment we heard what had happened, and it went around Jerusalem like wildfire, we followed him, just like we had in happier times in Galilee. It's what I've always done. When disaster strikes and I don't know what to do, I do what I normally do day in, day out, until the moment comes when I do know what to do again. So when we heard, when it felt as though the world was collapsing around us, we did what we had been doing for the past few years. We followed him. We followed him to Caiaphas' house and shivered through the long dark hours in the courtyard. We followed him to Pilate's house, listening with incredulous horror while the crowd cried out, crucify, crucify, all around us. We followed him to Herod's house and back again, and then we followed him where we never imagined we'd go, to his crucifixion. At some point during the long miserable wait, Mary Magdalene slipped away and came back with the other women, Susanna and Joanna. Mary Clopas' wife, and Mary Joseph's mother, and of course Jesus' own mother, Mary. It was pitch black by then, so we inched closer and closer, and we stood there. We stood there all cold, wretched day, watching as, breath by dying breath, our hope and dreams died before our eyes, and then everything we held dear. We had talked over the years, Mary and I, about the strange events that had happened when he was born. In the end, she told me about the angel coming. She even told me his name, Gabriel. We pondered together about it all, wondering what it all meant. The thing we talked about most was what Simon had said to her when she'd taken Jesus to 
temple as a baby. He said the strangest thing about who Jesus would become. He said the strangest things about who Jesus would become. The outrage he would cause and how he would reveal who people really were. He was right. I'd seen it so many of the people that Jesus met. I'd noticed it in myself. There was something about him, about him, and how that made you react, which simply revealed who you really were, even if you weren't aware of it at all. But it was the last thing that Simon had said that Mary puzzled about the most. Apparently, he turned to her at the end, looked at her with deep compassion, and said a sword would pierce her soul too. She'd wondered over the years what he meant. Perhaps he meant that awful moment when she thought Jesus was lost in Jerusalem. Perhaps he'd meant the pain of him leaving home, the desperate loss of her beloved firstborn son. Perhaps he'd meant the embarrassment she felt when she'd first heard that he had started teaching people without ever having studied with a rabbi first. Was that what he meant? We wandered together over so many hours. As I stood there that day and looked at Mary, I imagined that all those things we talked about felt like nothing more than pinpricks right now, as we were holding on to each other in our grief in a simple effort to stay upright. I discovered that she'd been thinking exactly the same as me. I heard her whisper quietly to herself, so this is what Simon meant. At some point during that lone, long, lonely vigil, the beloved disciple appeared quietly by our side. I don't know when he got there. That was just like him, never with a fanfare never drawing attention to himself, never forcing himself into situations. I think that was what Jesus liked so much about him. His company was gentle, undemanding, easy, when so many people wanted so much from Jesus all of the time, he didn't. He was just there. He was one of those people you felt better simply because they were there. From the cross, Jesus noticed him at almost the same time we did. Jesus hadn't spoken during that long, agonizing time, but just then he said, Your son and your mother, looking at one and then the other. Then he just looked at Mary, a look of pure love, and it broke my heart. And he wasn't even my son. A few moments later, he asked for a drink and sighed. It is finished. Then it was. Everything was over. Everything bar our anguish. We stood there for what felt like hours, numb and shocked. Then we did what we'd always done. We followed him. Some men we didn't know took his body off the cross. And so we followed them. They took them to a tomb nearby, and we followed them. We watched as they buried him. They didn't anoint him or use spices. They were in too much of a rush before sundown. They put his body on the ledge, rolled the stone across the entrance, and went away. We stood at a distance, unsure what to do next. We couldn't do anything the next day, it was the Sabbath, but we agreed we'd come back early on Sunday morning before anyone else gets up. We would anoint him then. You may be thinking that we hadn't thought it through, and you'd be right. Grief does that to you. We had no idea how we'd roll away the stone. The whole task, not just the rolling of the stone, but the anointing and the ceremony, all of it was a man's job, really. Normally our job was to lead the lamentation. But we had no choice. 
They'd run away, all of them, and there was only us. And after everything he'd been through, after everything we'd been through, we couldn't bear the thought that his body would be left there uncared for, unwept over, unanointed. <clears throat> we were doing what we'd always done, following him, caring for him as best we could, even when no one noticed. They said later that everyone ran away, but we were there. People often forget that, but we were there. I don't know about you, but I used to think that the male disciples bottled it, not having the courage to stand nearby the cross that day, thinking the risk might have been greater for them than for the women. But historical accounts tells us that the Romans had no qualms about crucifying women in that era. Many of the details we have about the death, burial, and resurrection are recorded because these women had the courage to stay near the cross, and after that, the courage to stay near the tomb, even when it seemed all was lost. Holy Week offers us the opportunity to evaluate our own positional closeness to Jesus and to count the cost of discipleship. Will we follow in the steps of those who were there with him? Will we honor his inclusive model of discipleship? Will we provide sacrificially to proclaim the good news to others? Will we risk reputations, relationships, and even our lives to follow? Will we stand near, watch from a distance, or run in the opposite direction. As Jesus hung in agony, many women stood by as witnesses to the very last moment as their saviour and friend suffered at Calvary's cross. Among these women experiencing heartbreaking pain were Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalena, and other women. While most of the disciples fled, these women stood by as witnesses to the Savior's death and then helped care for his body and become the first witnesses to his resurrection. The devotion to the Savior these women showed when he suffered the most cannot be overstated. They had not only had to witness one of the most gruesome forms of execution, but they were risking their own lives to support Christ on the cross. Accomplices to a criminal, including women, could be crucified as well. Think of the courage they had remaining there knowing this. These women showed us how we can stand with Christ even when others do not. Perhaps the most significant woman Standing by is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary is a unique witness of Jesus Christ. She saw the Savior open his eyes for the first time and close them for the last time as a mortal on earth. Perhaps in that heart-wrenching wrenching moment, she reflected back on her youth as an angel, older, she would be the mother of the Son of the Most High. At such a tender age, could she have fully comprehended what, she, what that actually meant? Or may she have thought back to Jesus, still an infant, only a few weeks old, when she and Joseph brought him to be presented at the temple in Jerusalem. As they entered the court of women, Simeon, a devout and righteous man, prophesied, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. And then to Mary he said, And a sword will pierce your own heart too. As a tiny child slept in her arms, or as a young child followed in her steps, could she have anticipated 
the moment she would watch him crucified on the cross, how desperately she must have wanted to soothe his pain. And yet she stood by his side, watching him die, so that through death, through his death, we all might have life. What a debt of gratitude we owe to this woman who raised Jesus as a child. In our own lives, we might be asked to do the unthinkable and watch a loved one suffer as we stand by helplessly. However, we can follow the example of Mary and keep our eyes focused on Christ. With no power to change the situation, we can find the strength to endure by looking to the Savior and encouraging those around us to do the same. My name is Mary. I come from Magdala on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Until Herod Antipas built Tiberias, Magdala was the biggest and richest city for miles around. My father used to love to say he was a farmer, and he was, of sorts, if you count strolling around his three vineyards and two olive groves, issuing orders to the slaves and sending his hundred sheep out with their shepherds as farming. I used to love watching the shepherd boys calling their sheep in the morning. The boys would come in the first light of dawn, ten or so of them, and stand outside the pen and call and call. The sheep would come flocking out, jostling around their shepherds, recognising their voices and ready for the day's journey to find grass. Then one day I woke up. The world felt very different. I felt different. I felt hazy and distant, as though a veil had settled over my mind. I would walk for miles and miles, restless and ill at ease. They told me I had evil spirits in me, even though I just couldn't take it in. I wanted to be alone, far away from the noise and the clamour of the people around me. Once, when I'd been out walking off my restlessness, I met a man sitting on the shores of the lake, talking to a large crowd of people. Something came over me. I knew I was talking, shouting and shaking, though I had no idea what I was saying. And then, all of a sudden, a wave of peace washed over me. The veil lifted, and I was myself again. The man, Jesus, they said his name was, smiled at me and signalled to the people around him that I should sit at his feet like a real disciple. I held back for a moment. It just wasn't seemly for a woman to do. But he signalled again and I couldn't resist. So I sat and I listened and I listened with the whole of my being. He was talking about being the good shepherd and calling his sheep and then knowing his voice and following him. I smiled at that bit. I knew how true that was. But then, when he talked about knowing the sheep by name and calling their names, I chuckled to myself a bit. He'd clearly never been around sheep very much. I mean, who in their right mind gives a sheep a name? Although I quite like the idea. From that moment on, I followed him. Me and a number of other women, like Susanna and Joanna and a handful of other Marys. And so I was there when they killed him. We women clinging together in horror as the unthinkable happened before our eyes. We watched where they buried him, hastily because the sun had begun to dip below the horizon, announcing the start of the Sabbath day. We sat together that day, barely moving or speaking. The shock had rendered us senseless. Then... As the sun dipped, marking the end of the Sabbath, I sprang to life. We had to do something. We'd agreed between us that we would return to anoint his body for burial. My first thought was the others, the male disciples. Anointing a man's body after death was a man's job. Perhaps they would know where he was laid. I found out where they were staying and hurried round. Who is it? An anxious voice shouted in response to my frantic knock. Mary from Magdala, I answered. The door opened a crack. What are you doing here? They might find us. James's anxious face peered out. Who? I asked, amused. The Romans, they always kill the followers after the leader, 
I pushed my way in, but soon saw there was little hope in it. The terror in the room was palpable. Peter sat in a corner, rocking and weeping. He's been like that ever since Thursday evening, Jane said sadly. We cannot get the word out of him. So I returned home, disheartened, my mind spinning. How on earth was I going to find myrrh and aloes enough to anoint his body in a city that I didn't live in? When I got back, I told the other women what had happened. I wish I'd kept my jar of nard now, said Susanna wretchedly. I had no idea we'd need it so soon. Sweet girl, Lisa's mother said from across the room, stirring herself from her grief ridden stupor. You honoured him in life. No gift is greater than that. We will find the spices we need. She was right. We did. We spread out across the city, begging, borrowing and buying what we could. In the early morning when we met together and compared our haul, we had, we thought, just about enough. We went, carrying large water jars between us, to bathe his poor battered body before anointing it. By the time we got near the place where the tomb was, the sun had just risen, casting eerie early morning shadows over the whole area. We'd been talking as we went about how we'd moved the stone that they'd rolled across the entrance. That's strange, Lomi said as we approached. The way the shadows fall make it look as though the stone has gone. We looked, all of us straining to see through the early morning light. That's because it has. James's mother said. Huff looked a bit sorted, but then started again. We couldn't bear to see what had happened now, but also we couldn't bear not to see. We peeped in through the entrance, and there, right inside the tomb, sitting as comfortable as you like, was a young man, his robe gleaming white. Don't be alarmed. Lomi let out a sound, a sound halfway between a laugh and a scream. He's not here. He's been raised. Go and tell the disciples, especially Peter. Tell them he's going ahead of them to Galilee. We turned and ran. We ran and ran and ran, dropping the water and the carefully gathered spices as we went, never pausing for breath until we reached the safety of our rented room. I did tell Peter and the other disciples. I broke into his room, weeping with the news of another disaster. Now, on top of everything, they'd taken his body as well. The shock of it was enough to jolt Peter from his misery, and they ran back with me to see the empty tomb. They got there first. Their legs were longer than mine. By the time I arrived, panting and out of breath, they'd seen for themselves that his body was gone, and the linen wrapping was lying there empty. After they left, I stood outside the tomb for a while, my eyes blinded with tears, wondering whether I could salvage some of the ointment we dropped in our terror a few hours earlier. I leant against the entrance and let my grief and my weariness take hold of me. After a while, I felt the overwhelming urge to look in the tomb one more time, so I bent and I looked in. The young man had now been joined by someone else. They were sitting at either end of the ledge. Why are you crying? they asked. I opened my mouth to answer when a voice behind me asked the same question. Why are you crying? A tumble of words burst out of me. When I told people about this later, I tidied up my words into a coherent, comprehensible sentence. The reality is I babbled on a tide of tears about my Lord and his body, and it was gone, and I don't know where, and I didn't know what to do. He waited quietly for my gibbering to fade away, and then he said just one word, Mary. The good shepherd had called my name, and I knew his voice with every fibre of my being. Later, people would ask me, those of us who'd met the risen Christ, what he had said that made us believe it was really him. Thomas would tell his story of Jesus' wounds and of being asked to put his hands in them. Peter would tell his story of Jesus asking if he loved him. And then they'd look at me. Mary met him first, they'd say, 
What did he say to you, they'd ask? He said, Mary, I tell them. Is that all? Didn't he say anything else? They'd look a bit disappointed. But I wasn't. Not for one moment. Mary stood at the feet of Jesus. Mary Magdalena. Earlier in her life, she had been possessed by seven demons and had been healed by the Savior. As a devout disciple of Christ, she remained at the cross after the disciples fled. Perhaps she did not want to leave him alone to suffer, for he had come to her in her moment of greatest suffering. Although the Sabbath was quickly approaching, Mary did not leave Christ's side. Even after he had died, we know that she was one of those that stood by as Jesus' lifeless body was lowered from the cross. Mary, with other women, tenderly helped to prepare his body for burial. Mary Magdalena's life teaches us that no struggle we face excludes us from having spiritual experiences. We can choose to stay close to the Savior, no matter what trials we may face or what our past has been. And like Mary, we can find the sweet joy found on Easter morn and run to invite others to come and see. Scripture records that most of the male disciples fled, except for the beloved disciple, often assumed to be John. Yet several women are mentioned at being present at the cross. It appears that many among the other women standing at the cross were the sister of Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Mary of Clopas, and Salome. My name is Mary. No, not the one you're thinking of. Not the mother of Jesus. No, not that one either. Not Mary Magdalene. There's so many of us Marys and Miriams around, it's easy to get confused. I am Mary, the one who is married to Clopas. I was there at the crucifixion, holding up Jesus' mother Mary as a sore pierced her soul, a brutal inch by brutal inch. Today we were walking home to Edna. When I say walking, it was more like dragging ourselves. More than once I felt like lying down on the edge of the road and never moving again. I don't think I have ever felt so weary and hopeless in all my life. I didn't really know what I'd been expecting, but it wasn't this. Jesus was the kind of person who gave you such hope. In him, in the world, in yourself. And I knew that if I kept looking near him, that hope would grow and grow and never stop. We had hoped that he would redeem Israel. Now I think about it, I'm not really sure I, what I thought that meant. He didn't have the look to be a military leader. I don't mean he was all meek and mild. He could rage with the best of them and did often. It was more that brandishing a sword wasn't his style. I suppose I imagined the whole host of heaven would come down and drive out the Romans as, it, as in the stories of old. I realise how daft it sounds now I say it out loud, but I did believe he would. I did believe he would. So this morning, after everything that happened, we packed our bags and went off. I thought it was a bit soon, but on that long, awful day on Friday, I watched my hope go away with every dying breath he took. And then the women came this morning to tell us the tomb was empty, saying something harebrained about him being risen from the dead. And we pushed outside and seen the world exactly as it always had been, Roman soldiers and all. The fight went out of me and we packed up and left. It was Clopas who started the fight. He started by grumbling that I'd been the one to pray about Jesus in the first place, and if it hadn't been for me, he'd have been comfortably at home right now. That did it. I let him have it. All my pent-up anger and hurt and bitterness spewed out over him in a mess of difficulty. I was taking a breath for the second wave when I became aware of a stranger standing there, smiling at us, asking what we were talking about. Clopas glared at him in disbelief. Are you the only one who has no idea what's been going on? The stranger smiled again. Maybe I am. Why don't you tell it to me about it while we walk? So we did. Turn and turn about, we told him about our hopes and our fears, about Jesus and what he'd meant to us. Stranger though he was, I found myself telling him things I'd never imagined saying out loud. 
We even told him about the story of the woman that he told this morning about him being alive. He listened and nodded and listened and nodded. Then suddenly he said, how stupid you are and slow to catch on. I thought he was a bit rude, frankly, but then he began telling us about the scriptures and I forgot to be annoyed. Starting at the very beginning, he laid it all out. He told my story, all my hopes and my dreams, in the words of the scriptures. My heart leapt and burned within me. I was so totally and utterly absorbed that I was amazed to hear him saying, Look, your village is just down there. I leave you here and travel on. We had travelled seven miles. It felt an instant. All of a sudden, I couldn't bear the thought of this stranger might leave us. It felt as though I'd known him all my life. It seemed Clopas felt the same, and so we begged and cajoled, pleaded and persuaded him to eat with us. Eventually, he gave in and came with us. I'd brought food back with us from Jerusalem, so it was only a matter of minutes before we were ready to eat. It was, I remember thinking, a bit forward of him to take the bread and bless it. That was Clopas's job as host, but the thought had gone as soon as it half formed in my mind. The arms of the man's tunic slipped downwards, and he raised his hands, revealing gaping holes in each. And the words, the words of blessing and gratitude to his Father in heaven, were words I'd heard every single day for the past few years. The words he'd said every time he took bread and blessed it. I knew, looked at the bread in my hand, and in that moment I knew, I knew it was him. He's alive, he is alive, he is alive. Clopas's mouth formed the words faster than mine did. You're, but he was gone. The loaf fell into the plate with a clap. We sprang to our feet and ran quicker than I could ever have imagined possible our feet beating the rhythm as we went. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. We arrived in Jerusalem, he backed us. I thought you went home, said Peter. Voices around the room chimed in. So did we. You might have said goodbye. You can't just go off like that. I was still panting, trying to catch my breath, unable to speak. We've got news, said Peter. Mary, yes, that one, the one you were thinking about, Jesus' mother, spoke quietly, but her voice cut through all of the rubble. If you give them a moment, I think you'll have them to pay attention. Throughout his earthly ministry, many women traveled with the Savior and were among his closest associates. Many of these women provided financial assistance and helped move the work forward. They showed an unwavering commitment and love for Jesus. Just before his death, these women traveled with their Savior more than 100 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem to attend the Passover. As we contemplate the feelings of the women at the cross, we gain a powerful window into our own experiences. If you've ever felt fear or anguish as a result of unexpected events, these women can understand. They show us that we can hold steady even when nothing is turning out how we had planned. If you've ever felt the devastation of watching your loved ones suffer, these women can understand. They teach us the importance of standing together as family and friends. And that just our presence can be a comfort to others. Because of Christ's atonement, we can look forward to a time when the Savior will swallow up death forever and wipe away the tears from all our faces. We can find hope and strength in the faith of these women who enjoyed this painful experience at the cross of our Lord and Savior. On that Easter morning, their sorrow turned to joy because the resurrected Savior lives so too can our tears dry, our sorrows be swallowed up, and we can feel the joy that only Christ can bring. I pray this Easter that you would have heard and been challenged by something, and that you will commit your life to Jesus.